Well, we're coming now in our series on Elijah and Elisha, where the transfer of the mantle of the prophet is going from the, you know, from one to the other, the place of leadership and so forth is transferring after many holy discouragements we talked about last week. Um, after those different experiences, they finally come to the River Jordan. And let's read this, this section just to get the whole picture here. And so let's read in 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. And as they've come to the Jordan, it says, Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither. And so they, too, went over dry ground. And it came to pass, when they were gone over, Elijah said unto Elisha, here's a change now, instead of discouragement, he's saying, Ask what I shall do for you before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of your spirit rest upon me. And he said, You have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass as they went on still and talked that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind unto heaven. And Elisha saw it and cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and he rent them in two pieces. And he took up the mantle of, the, of Elijah that had fallen from him and he went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him, and he smote the waters. And he said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And he, and he also had smitten the waters, and they parted hither and thither. And Elisha passed over. And so we see this picture of, of the master, of Elijah being taken unto heaven. He asks Elisha, What do you want? And Elisha responds, I want a double portion <coughs> of the spirit that's upon you. I want that upon me. You know, it's like he, he just saw what his master had, that anointing, that spiritual mantle, and he wanted it to increase upon him. Well, he wanted it to double, a double portion. And, well, we know that it did because when we look at, you know, what they performed, uh, the number of miracles that the scriptures record Elijah, Elisha performing, it was about double compared to his master. And, um, and so that, that thought of the double portion is pretty significant and important in, in Israel. Um, it had an important meeting. And it actually, it goes back to the family structure of uh, the eldest son in the family. And the eldest son would receive the double of what his brothers received. Um, so the father would divide the inheritance. Let's Let's imagine if there was three sons, the father would divide the inheritance four ways. Two parts would go to the eldest son, and then one part each to the other brothers. But it was not just to reward the firstborn, you know, like, hey, you were born first, so you get more. You get, you get an extra, you know, reward or something. In reality, it was to enable him. Because the firstborn, he became the head of the family, and he was now to care. The responsibility of the whole family came on the firstborn. And so it was kind of an, a big deal to be the firstborn because, you know, if you were secondborn, you could be like, oh, carefree. You know, kind of like you think about like these, the two princes in England. You know, the one, Prince William. William, that's it. Okay, I was thinking Charles, but that's his father. Prince William is, he's in line for the throne. He has to be so careful what he does and how he walks. And well, Prince Harry, I mean, he's 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 one separated, so he's like, that's that's not what he has to live for. So he can have a different outlook in life and so forth. But the firstborn, they have they have a care and a responsibility, and so they received a double, not so that they could have a great life. It's like oh, I'm firstborn, I get more. But they had that such a responsibility. They had to care for the rest of their family. And, you know, we're going to look at that concept of how that applies to us spiritually. But, you know, that was really the, the purpose of that. And, you know, we can see that in Scripture. 
There's one example that we can consider was Reuben. He was the firstborn of, of uh, Jacob. You know, and so he was, he bore the responsibility, even though his father was still alive, he still bore the responsibility, like, I'm responsible for my brothers, I'm the firstborn, and that was upon him, and, you know, we, of course, remember the story how the brothers were really jealous of, of Joseph, and, you know, they were conspiring against him, how can we, how can we get this dreamer who was having these dreams about us bowing down to him, and they weren't too happy, and so they found him, and they thought, okay, what can we do with this guy? We, he's not, we got him away from dad. We're going to do something to him. And, well, they took it pretty far. And it was Reuben, actually, who, who had to persuade his brothers not to kill him. And so to get some reason in it, what are you thinking? How are we going to face dad? And so somehow Reuben went away, and the brothers got the idea, well, let's just sell him. Let's get rid of him. We're selling him into slavery. You remember what happened when Reuben came back? He thought, he said this in, in Genesis 37, 29, Reuben returned to the pit, and that's where Joseph was. He was going to kind of figure out a plan to get him out of there and get him back to his father, and Joseph wasn't there. When he saw that, he rent his clothes, he returned to his brethren, and he said, the child is not. Where can I go? How can I go face my father? Because he's going to hold me responsible. I am the firstborn. And so the responsibility of the care for, for the brethren lay upon the firstborn. And that's pretty significant, I mean, because, you know, how we, with how we relate to God, when we think of this, this concept of the firstborn, even though it was in the culture of Israel, it was something that God recognized. God claimed the firstborn for himself. We see this in Exodus 13 and verse 2. It says, Sanctify me all the firstborn, Whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, <coughs> it's mine. He claims it. So the firstborn are not just those who take care of others. They belong to the Lord. And so we're kind of starting to see the spiritual meaning of this, of the firstborn. Those who care for others, those who belong to God. And so the Lord placed great importance on the firstborn, whether it was an animal or whether it was, it was a, a person. They were the Lord's. And so the families had to give an offering to the Lord to redeem them if they were the firstborn. Like the in Jesus' case, they had to present him in the temple and they had to offer an offering. And in their case, they offered the, the lowest level because that's what they could afford of, of two doves. And what they were doing is they were redeeming the life of their son who was the firstborn and giving that offering to God. But God is, is emphasizing this to us in the scripture. Really to speak to us. He's using these natural things to speak to us of something spiritual. Like the, of someone being born first, making an offering for it. It's, he wants to tell us about how we're to follow him, how we're to walk with him. Our, what our calling is as Christians. So in Hebrews, we can look at the spiritual side of this. Right, Hebrews talks about our, how our goal is not just to come to natural Mount Sinai. Right, speaking of just the kind of the, that's where Moses received the tables of stone, the law, the old covenant. But we're called to a new mountain. Hebrews 12, 22 says, you are come, or you could also look at that, you are called to come unto Mount Zion the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, verse 23, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn. Oh, that kind of gives us an idea of what God is calling his church to be. We are to be a church full of those who are firstborn, which are written in heaven to the God, the judge of all the spirits of just men made perfect. And so our calling in the New Covenant is to come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, right? We, we know that. That's our, you know, the name of our church because our, our call is to come dwell in his presence, to be with him for eternity. And we're to assemble together, but what are we going to be like? We're going to be like a, a big group of those who are firstborn among the brethren. It's not like a group of people who are saying, well, I'm firstborn, I'm better from among the brethren, but no, we're called as the firstborn were called. 
to be like them as we see it in the natural we are to be like them in the spiritual and so we're to be a company who take on the care and responsibility of others who are owned and redeemed by God in reality we're just following Christ that's the path he took wasn't it that's his example for us Romans 8 and 29 says, For whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to his image. And what's his image? <coughs> that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Christ is the ultimate firstborn. He was the one who gave himself, he gave up his throne, his ministry, his exalted position, and just came to serve the needs of others and I'm so glad he did mm -hmm. he came to serve our needs throughout many generations and then he was redeemed through his sacrifice he gave himself right? he died for his own you could say as the firstborn is redeemed by a sacrifice he became the sacrifice and so he became the firstborn and so he's saying follow me follow my example and so the call is to be firstborns ourselves, come into a company of firstborns and follow the example of Christ. This has special meaning to the church in the last days. You know, really, this is, that's what the church is. It's going to become so glorious, it's going to be a company of firstborns. Those who have given themselves to the service of Christ, but they've become Christ's. They've come into his glory because they've become his. You know, the, the early church had, had a measure of glory, but the last day church is going to have the double, the double portion. And think about what, it, I think we've read this several times in our, in our series, but Haggai 2.9, the glory of the latter house is going to be greater than the former because the church is going to enter into the double because we're going to be a company of firstborns. Another thought you can consider is, you know, when you consider the two tabernacles, Moses' tabernacle in the wilderness and Solomon's temple, it's interesting that when you look at the size of, of the inner part, right, the holy place and holy of holies, it's, it's kind of one section split into two. But, you know, in, the, in uh, Solomon's temple, do you know how much bigger it was than in Moses' tabernacle? exactly double it was double the size and so it, it's kind of a speaking to us is that you know they had a measure of the glory but as Paul said we are to come into a greater we're to come into the double the exact double God has a greater glory he wants to bring us into as a church one last thought before we kind of look at we're going to get into what does this practically mean right I mean that's good I want to be a what well, I want to be a firstborn I guess but how, what, what do I got to do? That's what we want to look at. But I want to just consider this last thought because we can see from Isaiah the Lord bringing this thought out. Isaiah 61 and verse 3. It says, To appoint unto them that born in Zion. And right? so that thought, he's calling us to his dwelling place, to Zion. To give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. And then verse 7. For your shame, you shall have double. It's in the same part. For your shame, you shall have double. And for confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. And so we kind of see a picture here relating to the last days. Here's a church going through difficulty through tribulation they endure it to the end and God turns their mourning into joy and gives them double but this is also a little hint of what does it take to be a firstborn among the brethren because we can understand there's some qualifications there's some experiences we have to pass through to become to qualify to follow in the step steps the footsteps of Christ in the way of the cross to being a firstborn who receives the double Back to that story of uh, Elijah and Elisha. 
when, Eli when Elisha, the servant, the, or the disciple, asked his master, can I have the double portion? Remember what, it, what the master said? You have asked a hard thing. And, you know, in reality, the disciple was going to have to go through some pretty hard experiences, some challenging experiences to enter into the double portion. And you see that he did in the story, and as you read in scripture, he experienced times of lack, times of drought, times of death and danger, and he had to intercede for on behalf of the nation and perform miracles of preservation and so forth, but in one sense, going through those things gave birth to the glory and to the miraculous for God to move in his people. And so we can understand that to be a firstborn among the brethren is to walk with God sometimes through hard seasons. But yet as we follow him and endure, he brings us into the devil. You know, to understand the concept of someone who becomes a firstborn, we only have to look at Joseph. Or as far as Joseph, we consider, you know, we saw how his brother sold him into slavery. He went through absolutely terrible times. I mean, it's hard to imagine brothers doing that. But I guess maybe brothers meant something different back then. I don't know. But they sold him into slavery. He went through such a terrible time. But then, in a day, it changed. And he was brought forth. And he became the ruler under Pharaoh. And really, he became the firstborn. Because he provided and cared for all of his family. And then later on, you can see that it was the tribe of Ephraim that became the tribe who really received the inheritance. They were like the firstborn and took it over from Reuben. Reuben stayed outside of the inheritance. Ephraim kind of became the, the, the ruler of the double portion tribe, you could say. But I wanted to look just at some of the qualities here. I won't take too long, but some of the qualities of what it means to become a firstborn, because that's our calling, to be a, a church or a company, an assembly of those who are firstborn, who will dwell with God in Zion. Well, one thought that we can consider in this, one thing that was quickened, and there's many things we could bring out, but one thing is that, you know, Elisha had a burden on his heart. As he traveled all of those different places, and his master was saying, Elisha, just stay here. Don't even bother. No, I'm going to continue. Because he had a burden on his heart. When finally his master said, okay, what can I do for you? Give me the double portion. That was his cry. His cry was, give me that double portion. And you, know, and you see the cries he, in, in 2 Kings 2.6, that, that example of, as, as he was discouraged, I will not leave you. As my soul lives, I will not leave you. And so when he finally came to that place, that, that he could receive, he said, I want the double portion. That was his cry. Let a double portion of your spirit. And so there was a sense that Elijah, or Elisha, was not just pursuing his, his master, but he was pursuing God. He was pursuing the spirit of God. Lord, I need your spirit. I see times ahead. He was already flowing in the prophetic, and he knew difficult times were coming. Lord, I need a double portion of your spirit. I need that. And so that was that cry that he was constantly lifting up to the Lord, and God was pleased to answer that and to give that to him. We see another time with Jacob, the patriarch. All right, we can remember Genesis 32 back when Jacob was coming back from his time with Uncle Laban and he had experienced the ultimate deceiver in Uncle Laban who kept changing Jacob's wages trying to get the most profit from him and you know but God kept blessing Jacob and so he tried to change his wages again Man, how can I get more money out of this guy well he, his, his way to do that was through deceit and all Jacob must have just hated that Perhaps because he saw a little bit of that in himself. 
as, as we saw in the earlier experience of him willing to go along with his mom and deceive his father to get the inheritance. And so as he's coming back and he's, you know, you can just sense that there's something in his heart. God, I need to change. Something has to change in my life. And he meets the Lord. And not, not only does he meet the Lord, this amazing story unfolds. He has a wrestling match with God. And that's just, who can write that? All right, he comes and he wrestles God. He wrestles the, the king of the universe, the creator of the universe. But uh, maybe what's the more remarkable part about this story is that God humbled himself to allow Jacob to do that. And perhaps that's a picture of what God does when we are crying out, when we're dealing with situations and, Lord, I'm not going to let you go. He humbles himself to allow us to lay hold upon him so that we can receive that promise or that word or that touch. And so they wrestled all night and God said, let me go. Kind of like that word to Elisha, stay here. God says, let me go. But Jacob replied this in Genesis 32, 26, I will not let you go except you bless me. Except you bless me. Jacob was desperate. He was desperate because he wanted to meet with God. He wanted a change to take place in his heart and his life. He saw how deceitful Uncle Laban was. And he saw that in himself. And he wanted God to change him, to transform him. So he cried and wrestled and wrestled to the break of day. And the thought here is that those who receive the double portion are those who cry out to God even in desperation, but also out of faith. They know they're convinced in their heart, God wants to bless me, so I will not give up seeking him and crying out to him until he does that. I'm not going to let him go. Another example that Christ gave us was in the New Testament. Remember the story of the unjust judge? There was a judge that did not fear God or man. I wouldn't want to get him as a judge in <laughs> dealing with my <laughs> situation. I don't know if he was just in it for the money or what, but he, he wasn't there to make righteous judgments. But there was a widow, and she needed a righteous judgment. And so she came. You know, there were enemies going against her and such, and so what did she do? She cried out, and she cried out, and she cried out until the judge basically said, I can't take it anymore. Normally, I wouldn't. I wouldn't give this judgment because he was crooked. Right? Normally, I wouldn't do that. But because she's wearing me out, I'm going to answer her request. That's kind of interesting how Christ shares this because he's sharing the perspective of a very wicked, crooked judge. And if that wicked, crooked judge will answer the request of this poor widow, how much more will our righteous God answer us? And that's the point of the story. Luke 18, verse 7, And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? Sometimes he has to allow a certain amount of time for his purposes to come to pass in our lives. But I tell you that when the day comes... He will avenge them speedily. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith in the earth? How much better is the God we serve than that crooked, wicked judge? He's merciful. He's gracious. He's kind. He has a perfect perspective and understanding. He knows everything. And if we will submit to that, but also lay hold upon him and cry out to him and not cease day or night as Jesus brings out. He will answer those, even if there's a delay, even if he knows the best time and we don't, and that's really the perspective we have to have, there's that delay, but if we lay hold upon him, he will answer us. There's one more thought. I'm just going to look at this here as we're closing it. 
there's something that that delay does in us. I, I think we can understand that. It works in us. It's hard. That's one of the hardest parts about seeking God. We can spend some quality time with our whole effort and our whole heart. Lord, okay, I'm crying out to you. I'm sitting. I'm doing everything. I'm listening. I'm reading the Bible. I'm praying. And nothing. Lord, how many times do I have to do that? That's, that's what our, our nature says. But it's doing something within us. It's stretching us. It's enlarging our capacity, our faith, our trust and belief in God that he will answer us. And, you know, I think it's very significant Jesus asks that question. Will the Son of Man find faith? Will he find faith? The Lord allows us to go through situations where we're crying out for his word or his direction or a change to take place. And it can be so stretching, it stretches every fiber of our being, of our spirit, of our understanding, of our belief in God, of our faith. And sometimes you go through situations, I don't know what, how you could describe it, but sometimes I, you feel like, like a pizza dough. You've seen those pictures of, of those guys that toss the dough into the air, up and down, up and down. And you think, that's a funny way to make pizza. But, you know, each time they do it, it's being stretched out, bit by bit. It's being tossed, right? Isn't that one of the terms, a hand-tossed pizza, right? Being tossed into and stretching it out, expanding it, enlarging it, so it can contain all those yummy ingredients. I'm sorry if I'm making you hungry. I like thin crust pieces, so I like it stretched out. But you know, it's it's that thought of being stretched and enlarged. It's kind of like the thought of the new wine skin. God wants to stretch us, and we go through those times where we feel like we're not going to make it without God intervening. Lord, you have to come through. Lord, I need to meet you in this area. In this situation, it's so stretching, it stretches every part of us. But as we hold on to our trust and belief that he's the righteous and just one, he's a just and good judge and God, he'll answer our request. But in doing so, he's allowing a change to take place in us. We're becoming new wineskins. We're becoming stretched, made flexible, increasing our faith in him to a greater degree, increasing our capacity. One last verse. Isaiah 54 and verse 2, I think kind of sums this up fairly well. Enlarge the place of your tent. Let them stretch forth your curtains and your habitations. Spare not, lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you shall break forth on the right and on the left. And your seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities inhabited. The heart of God is that we would be enlarged and stretched so that we can contain more of him, more of his ways. And as that, hap as that takes place, something happens. There's a breaking forth on the right and on the left. A double breaking forth. A double portion. And so God desires that his children be enlarged. He wants to give us his heart. A heart that can care for others. Carry the burden of others. Intercede for others. He wants to bring us into that place of the firstborn. Where he gives us his heart, his capacity to care for them, not just in the natural, but in the spiritual. And, you know, it's quite sobering when you think about that, is that God wants to give us the responsibility to care for another soul, another eternal being. That puts fear in me. Lord, I need your blessing. I need your word. I need your spirit, your anointing. Lord, I need to change in me. Do it in me. And as we cry out with a heart of faith and not let him go, he'll do that. He'll do that, develop that within us through some very stretching experiences at times, but those experiences produce such wonderful things, enlarging our capacity to receive more 
of Jesus so that we can pour him out on others so that we receive the double portion of his spirit and become one of those assembly of the church of the firstborn who are on Mount Zion. And Father, we just thank you for that one.